no two within almost three or four hundred meters of each other. In the Opdat area, we got perhaps our heaviest concentration came within what is now the generally termed Levantine or Ignacian. Uh, the sites were mostly surface sites on ridges, with very little soil, very heavy concentrations of artifacts over fairly wide areas. The two most important sites, probably, though, occurred on the Deep Shone Plain, which is an area in here. Um, both were deflated, yet deflated in place. They cover easily 2,000 square meters each. The artifacts are absolutely fresh. There's some patination, but they, in places, go down 10 to 15 centimeters in depth. In one of them, we have, it seems to be quite clear evidence, either for what is activity areas or what is possibly a series of camps, small camps, very much in the same locality. Uh, technologically, the whole area of this site seems to be quite homogeneous. There's radical differences in occurrence of cores and certain kinds of tools. One of the striking things about this upper tier electric material is we have, I guess, seven or eight sites of this type, and no two sites seem to be very similar. They are similar in the sense that the same kinds of tools occur. And there's a very heavy emphasis on this range from the carinated scraper to the polyhedric burin. And I'm not at all sure that it's possible to draw up very discrete lines between these types. They tend to merge. It's very, there are an awful lot of pieces where it's very questionable whether it's a thick nose scraper or a polyhedric burin. Um, <clears throat> But no two of the sites seem to be very much the same in terms of occurrence of various artifact classes. And it looks to me at this point as if each one of these sites, which is really they're quite large, represented camps, rather traditional camp sites of people who came consistently back to very much the same immediate vicinity. One would expect to find with the heavy occupation a series of small sites very much the same. But we don't seem to get this. We just get these large sites or complex of camps that are quite different. In the same area at a later time period, we find very little occupation. However, what we found is very good. There is a, in the Nafel Zin, the bottom, near the springs, we have one site which one might call geometric cabarn. It's a very late cabarn with a tendency for a shortening of the back and double truncated pieces into actual geometric proportions. Uh, this site is in situ. We have carbon samples from it, which are being run now. It would be the first cabarn site dated in any way. Also, possibility of architecture. We weren't able to dig enough to fully prove it, but it's very suggestive at the moment. We were only allowed to test these sites, not even get six square meters that site. And needless to say, at the edge of it, we caught the edge of what looked like a wall and couldn't go on. Also, there in situ was a very nice, typical cabarn type end scraper with sickle sheen along both on both edges, and beads as well. So it, it may be much more complex than what is normally considered a barn. In fact, it, must, it may be later than what's considered a barn. Uh, a slightly different type of microlithic <coughs> assemblage occurs up above the Nachal Zen, a site of about 900 square meters in area, and just solid artifacts going from the surface down about 40 centimeters with a fair amount of bone, some grinding stones, large bedrock mortars, and 
Unlike the barn, which has no lunettes, none of the archback type of tools, this site consists of huge numbers of lunettes, archback blades, with a very heavy microburin technique. Uh, we excavated two square meters from the two square meters to a depth of 40 centimeters. We got over 1,500 retouch tools, of which over 50%, if you consider microburins tools, which I don't, uh, over 50% were microburins. There must be 10 microburins to every geometric, at the very least in that particular area. We tested one other area which had almost no microburins at all. And we may have some indication here of an activity variance. Obviously, more work has to be done there. Sorry, what did you say the sun is called? Uh, E22B16. <laughs> Super. Yeah. Uh, we're getting careful about naming things. Uh, but with the number of sites we have, we have to start out with this time of name. Uh, we also found one in situ, quote, Neolithic site. I uh, don't like the term very much. Down in the bottom of the Nahal Zen, a huge fireplace, which happily or one test pit just quartered it. And this will be dated, but it has very typical uh, Tahunian points, very long blades, large burins on large blades, uh, very nicely serrated pieces. It's a huge site, probably a series of camps, mostly deflated. The interesting thing about the site is if it is Tahunian, whatever, there is not a single grinding stone, there is not a single sickle blade. We have a quite large sample from it. Uh, this may be a, a camp, a hunting camp from people from the Jordanian Plateau, which was a much better, which is very close, 10 to 15 kilometers away up here. So you say there is no bottom? No, not at all. Uh, we did flotation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we didn't get it yet. Is it a ground or polished stone? None. Wait, that's not true. We have one uh, groove stone. Yeah, uh, Dharma Mesopotamia. There are two on this. We do have four square meters. <laughs> uh, we have Capra and Dharma. Yeah. And also, the I just got the formal report, and apparently some of the site numbers were confused as to the periods and the union between site numbers, and it has to be straightened out. But there is fauna at the site, and though I don't imagine it's going to be a great deal, it was in the fireplace. Now, is there more of an E22, D16? Yes. Yes. Can you say what that is? I think I probably can. It's a little hard interpreting this. Report, but sure not. You know, like the time of the No, it's just about impossible. At the time when I gave it to him, he said, uh, "This is sure uh, not." Uh, he said there was Capra and possibly Gazelle, but I don't know. We had two square meters, and I think there were two or three uh, bones with surfaces. Um, we get a very completely different type of occupation and settlement pattern of the Heimlicke. We have two, we surveyed 15, I think it was 20, 25 square kilometers. We have Two sites which are Levantine or massive. They seem very similar to the things in the uh, Avdat area. Though blades seem to be relatively rare in all of these sites, with the exception of one in the Avdat area. We then have large numbers of extremely large microlithic concentrations of, well, three kinds. One, at view, looks much more typically Kumbaran than the thing in the Akdad area. 
the typical tool is the back and truncated blade, the Lenowski Lima, except almost all of them have kind of a minor feature where the, convex, uh, the truncation is convex and the backing is concave. The bulb is intact. Uh, this has been published, uh, one or two of these have been published by Tamar Israeli for the uh, Ramat Matred, the IMJ. But this is the very typical tool of these sites. We have none of the typical Kabara points, the elongated scaling triangles, and it's in one in any site. Are any of your assemblages generally like those which Buzi and Newfield had excavated? Well, it's kind of hard them. to tell. One of them, point one point something or other, published. Point, point one of the four of them, several of them. Point of the Romans. I, I saw that. Just, no, it's not. No. And how about the Buzi site? I bet the article. Can you tell what it is? <laughs> I can't tell what it is. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it was someone said. The, this, this, this kind of site is the most common site up in the Harbor Along with this, we have a few sites <coughs> relatively amazing. One is 9,000 square meters in area of solid artifacts. You put one test trench, one test pit in, and we're still going at 40 centimeters. Have just solid artifacts and bone. Uh, we took random, with a site like that, we took random one square meter units, collected, I believe, 10 of them. And they ranged just on the surface. They ranged from retouch tools, not counting the retouch, from 100 to over 200 per square meter. It's an incredibly rich site. Uh, large numbers of microburins, no grinding zones over the whole site. Uh, lunates, geometrics, there are some that are so small, we had to put everything in the test trench to window screen get the artifacts, not just the microfauna. Uh, it's just unbelievable what it looks like. Uh, this site has large numbers of microburins again and sickle blades. Another site up higher on it, plateau itself, had large numbers of grinding stones and not a sickle blade. This house rings, or at least two tent rings, and Corvette points, Chateau Crone points, uh, some lunates, which were tiny, a lot of microburins, and a certain kind of rather simplified point, stem point, which I've never seen in publication before. <coughs> no, not at all like those. We also get a lot of Antalya from all of these lake sites, and the Antalya is heavily uh, from the Gulf of Aqaba, rather from the Mediterranean, which is typical for the uh, Atufian. Uh, we have another season to go, and analysis has really just begun on this material. But it seems that <coughs> the Negev is certainly quite complex, particularly in the late Paleolithic range. And I saw nothing which I could, in good faith, call Matuf at all. And I saw nothing which I could call typical Kabarin. So as this material may well be a facies, a regional facies of the bar, but as you move south, apparently, the typical northern Levantine sequence and characterizations probably don't stand up. And it's possible in my mind that as one continued south, you would get these slow shifts and regional specializations, which would not be terribly different from some of the things we're getting in Egypt at the moment. There is nothing in the high Negev which is specifically like anything in Egypt. But the tendencies may be there, uh, more so than in northern Egypt. Yeah, yet, yet going, going a little further north, yet what we find in Sarah Hill and Tixier's recent excavations is typical, it is nothing like the Kabara McCoy typically straight back point blade for that point, Negro with that bed, such as what was found earlier and published earlier. Well, and he's finding the same yeah, I should say one thing. We originally were going to test three environmental zones within the Negev, one of them being the coastal zone. 
we found after asking that the density of concentration of landmines was slightly higher than the density of concentration of artifacts. And we love the idea. But it's possible the coastal zone has, in fact, a different kind of basis itself. There are some big collections of uh, Cretan and Borea. Yeah, there's the ones that uh, Oprah Barrio said was worth it. I saw them. And they are quite different. Tony, yeah. just a quick question. What is, what is the core technology like? Um, well, we have two sorts of things. They're using two materials. They use, I don't know the sources. The sources are probably in the Wadi Bottoms and so are the mines. So I haven't looked too hard. Uh, they're using a kind of a chalcedony, very shiny material, which comes in small nodules. The cores tend to be single platform ground. Not terribly beautiful, but not bad either. Uh, the larger material, the end scrapers, the sorts of things tend to be on a flint, on a chert, and we really don't have a cause for those. Is it possible that, 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 well, do you have evidence that these, where you get these end scrapers on different material, that you've got uh, enough debitage at those sites to justify saying that they are workshop sites, or is it possible that no, they are not at elsewhere? Uh, that is just in the process of being done. The basic technology and basic observations are being done. But I would say that most of the church material may well have been roughed out someplace else. These coils, cores are very small, also, generally. Well, not. They're generally. Uh, before you yes. before we uh, break up here, we look at your house, housekeeping uh, chores, Tony, and then we go over the side of stuff. Uh, those of you that uh, I hope you can remember the name or the, what they look like in any rate of a student who went out for lunch because that student is responsible and that's made out of arrangement for you to get to the, uh, to, uh, the dinner this evening. And uh, could I pass around these, these things, pass one back to back. And uh, there's another little housekeeping chore the secretary has asked to pass on to you. Many of you came here with open tickets to go back. And if you want us to help, we'll be glad to help you get a reservation wherever you want to go with that, with that ticket. But uh, could you do it early in the morning when you come? Uh, go and see her and tell her about when you want to leave and uh, about whatever, you know, where you're planning on going so she can get to try to make a reservation for you. Well, well, really? Really? Yeah. Light that, that's that's on the 25th. Yeah. Let's just the flight schedule. The flight schedule will change on, on Saturday and the airlines mm -hmm. not very well manned on Sunday. Shall we take a look at these things? I know this has been a, a terrible way to, to look at artifacts. Let's go look at them. I brought up another box full of those uh, materials and questions. Yeah, we'll get these things that are on just flights, and that's not, 
no longer just referring to the. But that's no longer referring just to these big places, big volumes, so forth. It's now taking on a connotation of these whole industries. There were giants in those days. Yeah. David? We are the transverse grant. Is this one still the same thing? Yes, yeah, it's the same thing, yeah. Not necessarily exactly the same same, same formation. Yeah. Well, it's over there. Yeah. It confirms the same thing. Well, that's my number two piece. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you say it's out of a graph. They call this a cleaver. Well, yeah, that, that's the one you said you doubted went with that anyway. That's the one piece that doesn't look to me like the long as in there. That, that would bring me like a good idea. Trapezoidal cross section, you have two straight edges. And it's very common to do this in the start of the On the side of them, to have a design of vibration and trimming of the something that's being raised into a concavity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a marginal space. Kind of waited towards the side screen or something, and then he also, you know, it's on a clear reflection. Yeah. Did you see this? But I mean, this is, this is in a sense of the sort of weakness of psychological class to get within, because it really is simultaneous to two things. And you can, you have, if you, the board system demands that you put every piece in one category and one category alone. Yeah. What do you do with that? <laughs> That's interesting. Gordon was calling the point, wouldn't he? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think so. I'd call it an obverse straight up and triangular. Mostly, but it's not a bifid. Well, this other thing that you're doing is an authentic thing. No. This is tape number three of the Nile Conference, 24th of April, 1970, morning session, session three. That's another story. 
that is relevant, but uh, in a more general sense, it's actually not that critical. Um, I'm not quite sure how to begin this point, but um, I did circulate some thoughts um, about this session that posed some specific questions. Um, I would like a Can they have been stripped off? 
very done completely between us. In the areas where you work? The, between, essentially in the second cataract area. Yeah. I think that's what's happening. I, 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 don't, I have an explanation for it. <coughs> but it is also conceivable. If you consider the long stretches of the Nile from the second cataract to the uh, Egyptian border, even <coughs> most of the period air cells have been completely eroded out, and even in many areas, the Sahara cells have been eroded out. And it's not provided. I mean, we have big stretches on the sides of the river where there are almost no cells at all, except the very most. Sanford and Arkell described as their 15 meter Ashley examples. <coughs> and uh, these very distinct and red soils that you also refer to. The uh, calcification zone on the top.
uh, I think it's related to the question before the House today. <coughs> we posed in the, in the Nubia body uh, system of the dialogic adjustment, which began, if you recall, essentially with what we thought was called late paid lifting. And uh, this influenced uh, a, lot of, a lot of our thinking. First of all, if you recall in Nubia, all of those uh, Ashley and late paid lifting sites back to Plane level, basically, 
subdivide in a very normal fashion because of canola legislature. Among themselves, there is a whole sequence, and each one of these is very intensively loaded with deep red soil bomb. And uh, the youngest of that group, Anubia, still has in places uh, over two meters of very intensely weathered uh, soil and in fact uh, strong dirt. Species of 
employees who were getting into operations constantly in the late washes and so on that are related to periods of vacation. So uh, since these snails seem to be completely extinct in, uh, in northeastern Africa and obviously don't live without uh, locally produced vegetation the sort of thing you can for extinct even show up any grazing and fuel activities in the wadis removing let's say acacia scrub and so on. There must have been conditions quite unlike those of today. So it seems natural they deposit that uh, uh, presumably during some parts of the Asturian occupation and certainly during much of the Ashleen occupation that uh, conditions for subsistence outside of the valley must have been radically different. That explains it, right? <coughs> the distribution of the sites, I think, outside of the valley, and perhaps the sites have been destroyed, the valley sites. Because we must assume that the valley was there, I think, now. Uh, and, the, and the sites were immediately adjacent to the valley, so they went out from those uh, spots. So you're suggesting that the Australian sites might correspond to the, what has been found within the valley, and in fact, just to get the that they might be in the valley. There are other material <coughs> which are kind of technically in the valley. They're on the tops of very small and simple remnants. Less than a quarter of a kilometer in width. But it's just on that fringe area that nothing was found under the sills <coughs> or in any of the so formations that we recognize in here. The, the other point which, which occurs to one about this, what Carl has just said is that it presumably is a rather low degree of stratigraphic resolution.
are getting the bigger wadis bringing in various kinds of igneous rocks that are used for all kinds of purposes. And um, come up with plain, practically everything is in a, a sort of basalt, dolerite type, uh, integrated rock type. And further north, uh, depending if you're getting local uh, products only, you're getting the Eocene and other tertiary rock flints. And uh, if there's a big east bank water you're getting in, you still have to you know, this is pattern continues all the way up the river from there. Uh, there simply isn't in all of these local deposits that I've ever seen it. Uh, Hooty church or any of these uh, uh, colorful looking churches that have come out of central Sudan. I think probably the major reason is simply that there was such a tremendous influx of local bedlam that uh, these things don't re aren't recorded possibly because we're not getting the middle of the actual Nile with all of the local tributaries most of the time. Uh, in the late Pleistocene, however, no other bed loan in fact can supply the Nile but by uh, what goes on south of the Sahara Axis. You're getting the Hootie Church sort of playing a disproportionate role in the bed loan because it's the only bed loan in fact that's being introduced. And for this reason, it sort of gives you an off-sized representation. In other words, it's possibly just how much material is there, A, and B, secondly, the uh, question of uh, are you getting, in fact, the Nile bed low or the tributaries? Uh, uh, there's a, a, an ancillary question that just occurred to me. Jeez. I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, Will Smith yesterday suggested that I'm wrong on this, and I think he may be right. But it occurred to me that there is a, a drop off as one goes north in the use of Nile. Be 
mostly, mostly hand axes and large fish plates. So there should be a lot of there should be a lot of small, small tiles. I never worked in the shooting side. I was on some of the sites that you show us that were in very short periods of time. My impression is there were great numbers of not only large plates, but very small debris plates. My, my knowledge, they've never dealt with the system that you show us in the But I think almost every site that they were my impression that they were at uh, what had to be considered workshops. I mean, some of them were a quarter square kilometer solid plates. We had one which was over a half square kilometer with the depth of the full data over the depth of 40, 50 centimeters of just solid plates. <coughs> you, know, you couldn't do anything with this site. It probably covered many periods. But they're small plates. Yeah. But the, the, they have, uh, where they did make their systematic collections, they got everything off the ground. There was yeah. nothing, uh, it was a bare ground. You could, you could still uh, find those squares, those four meter squares. But those and yet there was nothing other than the very sandstone. And the Chmielewski's excavations, uh, I'm sure he would have dealt with any tool, uh, any retouch piece. Yes, he has one of those. And uh, the cheese. So I, I'm fairly, uh,